Oh, good afternoon. My name is Paul Rudensky. I'm the Senior Director for Education here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, Living Memorial to the Holocaust. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to today's program, which is entitled Anne Frank from Diary to Book. Anne Frank and her diary have become among the most iconic images of the Holocaust. Before Anne Frank's diary became one of the most one of the world's most widely read books, it was a private manuscript. The book, the book that millions of readers know as the diary of a young girl, has a complicated history of writing, rewriting, and editing by several hands. Since its first publication in the original Dutch in 1947, it has appeared in dozens of translations and hundreds of editions. Each edition presents the diary anew with different introductions, explanatory material, and cover art. At the same time, Anne Frank's original diary and its plaid notebook has become a treasured icon commemorating in museum exhibitions, films, and even architecture. Uh, we are very pleased and honored that Professor Jeffrey Chandler will explore with us today the many transformations of the diary and will shed light on how Anne Frank's life and work have become fixtures of, the pub, of public culture throughout the world. In doing so, Professor Chandler will raise questions of who represents the Holocaust, as well as the tension between presenting the Holocaust as a particular history versus something which fits into a more universal understanding. And I'm just going to admit a few more people and continue with my introductory notes. Okay. Uh, our plan for today is as follows. Professor Chandler will, spe will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, after which time we will invite questions from the teachers attending the program. Please feel free to use the chat function to submit questions, which will be read after Professor Chandler speaks. Um, and let me just say, it's best to write those questions down first and then send them to, send them to me uh, as uh, Professor Chandler concludes speaking. Uh, our plan is to uh, end at 2 p.m. Uh, after the lecture today, we will send you a link uh, to an online evaluation form either today or tomorrow. Please plan to spend a few minutes completing it. Your feedback is important to us and to our funder, the Claims Conference. I appreciate your taking this task seriously. Uh, our next program, which is for, which is specifically for teachers in Jewish schools, um, although if other people want to come, they're welcome, will be on Sunday, December 26th, and will be entitled, or is entitled, Concealed Treasures, Objects Taken uh, into Hiding During the Holocaust. Professor Natalia Lexun will examine items that people took into hiding and how these objects remain significant today. Significant today. I'd like to take a moment to thank the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany for funding today's program. Okay, and um, uh, in a moment, I would like to hand the microphone, the virtual microphone over to our speaker, Professor Jeffrey Chandler. I just want to admit a few more people uh, and let give them a second to, to, to come aboard. Okay, and let me see if I can do that, the live transcript. Uh, enable live transcripts. Okay. I believe I've enabled the live transcript. Uh, somebody requested that. I see that it's appearing, so I think we did it. Okay. Uh, Professor Sandler, I hand the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you, everybody, for joining me today. Um, as Paul mentioned, I'm going to start with a presentation which is illustrated by slides. So I'm going to share my screen now, and then I'll come back for our Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation. So in the 74 years since its initial publication in Dutch, Anne Frank's diary, uh, has appeared in over 60 different languages, has been sold in well more than 30 million copies. Uh, uh, that makes it one of the world's most widely read books. Moreover, the diary has been printed in hundreds of editions uh, in diverse formats. Uh, there are abridged versions, anthologized excerpts, uh, some are published with Anne's other writings. 
Uh, there are teacher's editions and student editions. There are limit editions for book collectors, uh, such as uh, one that was published in France in 1959 with a frontispiece, which you see here by the artist Marc Chagall. There are also sound recordings, and this is an album cover of one of them. The published diary has appeared with different redactions of the original text and with various titles, cover designs, introductions, illustrations, and epilogues. So each publication of the diary presents a distinct mediation of Anne's writing. But how did the diary become a book or rather this whole series of books? And how has this transformation of diary to book shaped Anne Frank's stature as an icon of Holocaust memory. So before turning to that, I just would like to give some background about Anne, her family, and her life story. Uh, Anne Frank, who is uh, standing uh, between her parents in this photograph, was born on June 12th, 1929 in Frankfurt, Germany. In 1935, Anne, her parents, and her sister Margot, who you see on the left, moved to Amsterdam to escape anti-Jewish laws in Nazi Germany. In Amsterdam, her father, Otto, opened a business selling jam-making supplies. The family was middle class and cosmopolitan in their cultural outlook. Anne went to a progressive Montessori school. But after the start of World War II, the Netherlands was occupied by Germany in the spring of 1940, and anti-Jewish laws went into effect, restricting where Jews could go to school, to work, to shop, to travel, to be entertained. As in Germany, Jews in the occupied Netherlands were required to be identified on their official documents and to wear a yellow star with the word Jew on it on their clothes. In 1941, the Franks lost their German citizenship and that meant that they were stateless. Soon, Jews in Amsterdam were being arrested and deported ostensibly to work camps in the East, but actually they were sent to concentration camps and extermination camps. Otto Frank tried to get his family out of Europe to the United States, but he had no success. Then he secretly made plans to take his family into hiding, something that quite a few uh, uh, other Jews were doing in the Netherlands and doing this to avoid the roundups and deportations that had been taking place. Uh, meanwhile, Anne and her sister were going to a Jewish school. Anne was a very social young woman and had a large circle of friends. She turned 13 on June 12th of 1942. One of her presents was a notebook, which we see here for keeping a diary. And she starts keeping her diary within a day or so of getting this notebook. Two weeks later, the Frank family goes into hiding on July 6th, 1942. This was something that until that day was unbeknownst to either Anne or her sister. They went into hiding with another Jewish family, the Van Peltzes. In the published diary, they're known as the Van Dans. Uh, eventually, another man, Fritz Pfeffer, who's known as Albert Dussel in the diary, joins them in their hiding place. It's located in the upper floors of the rear half of 263 Prinzenracht, the building in which Otto Frank's business is housed. This is a picture of uh, the building. It's, it's in the middle from the period. Uh, in Dutch, this part of the building, this back part of the building is called the Achterhaus, and it's usually translated as the annex, sometimes the secret annex. Several uh, non-Jewish employees of Otto Frank's business who now were running it because he could no longer do so, uh, protected the Jews in hiding. They brought them food and other things that they needed as the Jews could not leave their hiding place. And they remained in the Achterhaus uh, for little more than two years until they are discovered on August 4th, 1944 and were deported 
uh, each winding up uh, being sent to different camps. All but Otto Frank die during the war. Anne and her sister die in Bergen-Belsen in early 1945, shortly before the camp was liberated by the British. When the Jews, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, when the Jews were arrested in uh, August of 1944, uh, most of their belongings had been left behind, and that included Anne's diary. Mipris, who was one of the women who helped hide Anne and the others, discovered the diary shortly after they were all arrested, and she put the diary away for, capes, keep, for safekeeping in the hopes that she could return it to Anne after the war. But uh, eventually Otto Frank uh, returned to Amsterdam after the war and with time learned that Anne, her sister and their mother had all died. Uh, at that point, Mipris gave the diary to him. Otto Frank read it and was astonished at his daughter's thoughtful writing. He decided to share some excerpts of the diary with family and friends and they encouraged him to get it published. Eventually, the diary was published in a small Dutch edition in 1947, and this is the cover of that first edition of the diary. Translations into other languages uh, soon followed, into French and German in 1950, into English in 1952, and then beyond into other languages. The diary became more widely read uh, in these languages, of course, having a much wider readership than the number of Dutch readers uh, uh, generally. Uh, a drama based on uh, the diary premiered uh, on Broadway in 1955, and the play was subsequently performed internationally within a year of its opening on Broadway. This begins. Uh, the play and its 1959 film adaptation, a poster of which you see here, uh, established the diary's worldwide popularity. Many people saw the play or the film and then turned to read the diary. The, uh, the diary continues to be translated into other languages and to inspire a growing number of tributes and creative engagements with Anne's life and work. So, how did the diary become a book? The diary is portrayed in plays and films. This is a, a, a picture from an amateur production of a girl playing Anne. It's, it's portrayed as a single notebook, but it was actually a series of notebooks of which this uh, plaid covered notebook that I showed you earlier was just the first. The plaid notebook becomes a symbol of the diary itself, and it winds up being uh, reproduced or evoked on many uh, covers of the published diary uh, and uh, on posters for performances of its stage adaptation. But by December of 1942, Anne had filled that plaid notebook that she received on her birthday, and at that point, Mipris gave Anne another notebook to continue her diary. And she wrote more entries in at least one more notebook. In addition to keeping her diary, Anne also had aspirations to be a writer. While in hiding, she began to work on short essays, short fiction, and she even began a novel. These were eventually published in a collection in English known as Tales from the secret annex. Then on March 29th, 1944, Anne wrote in her diary that she had heard an appeal from a minister in the Dutch government in exile, they were in, in England, broadcasting over Radio Orange, uh, asking the Dutch people to document their resistance to Nazi occupation. And she decided to rework her diary into a book for publication. By late May of 1944, Anne noted in her diary that she had begun reworking her early entries, now writing on loose sheets of paper. And at the same time, she was continuing to make new diary entries in her notebook. So these are uh, 
the loose sheets of paper on which the rewritten diary appeared. Anne envisioned the revised diary as a literary project. It was uh, to be a kind of novel based on her family's months in hiding and her own reflections on the experience. She continued working on both of these versions of the diary, rewriting the old entries and then writing new entries until the last entry on August 1st, 1944. That's just a few days before she and the other Jews in hiding were arrested. Uh, and left uh, this rewritten diary unfinished at the time of her arrest. Also, after the war, it was discovered that one of the diary's original notebooks was missing. So there are two incomplete versions of Anne's diaries, the remaining notebooks and the rewritten sheets. This is what it all looks like. When Otto Frank decided to have his daughter's diary published, he had to figure out how to integrate these two incomplete versions of the diary. And in doing so, he created a third version of it. So here's a chart uh, that shows you uh, these different versions of the diary. And, uh, if, actually, if you start at the bottom, uh, which I've indicated in blue here, you have the first diary notebook uh, from uh, uh, June to December of 1942. Then there's this gap of one, possibly more than one notebook that are, are missing. Then you have a second and a third original diary written between December, late December 1943 and uh, uh, the second one until uh, April 17th of 1944, the last one from April 17th, 1944 until August 1st. So those are the three original notebooks. Then the loose sheets in which Anne was rewriting the diary she goes back to uh, the first entry from June 12th and had rewritten entries up to March 29th of 1944. So around the time that uh, she heard that radio broadcast appealing to uh, people in the Netherlands who were in the resistance or who were hiding to document their experiences so that people could find out about them after the war. So, as you see, there are these two incomplete versions. At the top, the green line uh, indicates the full run of the diary that Otto Frank redacts from these two different versions. And they are known respectively as version A, the original notebooks, version B, the loose sheets, and version C, the published diary, Het Achterhaus, uh, in Dutch. Uh, So this was something um, that until the late 1980s, most people didn't know about this complicated history. Most people read the diary, whether it was in Dutch or in German or in English or one, what language and assumed it was this one uh, uh, book. Um, and it wasn't until 1989 when the critical edition of the diary was issued. It was actually first published in Dutch, then published in English, uh, that compare these three versions. And the book reveals the process by which the diary was rewritten, written and rewritten and edited. I'm gonna show you one sample page just to give you a sense of what one can, can discover. So this is an entry for November 10th, 1942 from the first notebook. And um, I'll just point out a few things here that you, uh, uh, for you to consider. So uh, the original entry begins, dearest Emmy. You might wonder who's Emmy? Um, we know the diary is having been addressed to Kitty. Well, in, in Anne's early entries in the diary, she wrote the diary entries as if they were letters to a series of imaginary friends. Um, there's about a half a dozen names. They're not names of her actual friends, but uh, they appear to be names of girl 
Dutes who appear in a very popular series of young adult fiction in Dutch at the time that Anne had read and, and really, you know, very enthusiastic reader of. So these uh, imaginary characters were the people to whom she addressed her diary entries. But in, uh, uh, in, in thinking about uh, what to do when she was rewriting the diary, she said, no, they the entry should all be to one uh, uh, persona and that that would, that would just work better as a literary work. So one of the things we see is Anne evolving as a writer. Uh, you'll notice that version B, which is her rewritten version, um, so being done, uh, uh, you know, a year and a half later from the original entry, um, that uh, it's longer and uh, we see sort of changes in the writing. So uh, you notice that the first version begins, today we were probably taken by surprise again for we had been saying once more that we really ought to take in another person. Version B begins, great news, we want to take in an eighth persons. Yes, really, we have always thought that there was quite enough room and food for one more. So it's not only more information, it's a livelier text and she's trying to make her writing uh, more engaging for a reader. So it's not a, a typical diary entry where you're writing for yourself. She's writing for a readership. Uh, she also gives us more information about this eighth person. Uh, she mentions that uh, he's a dentist called Fritz Pfeffer. He lives with a much younger, nice Christian woman to whom he is probably not married, but that doesn't matter. Um, in version C, Otto Frank keeps a lot of Anne's language, although he starts putting in pseudonyms. And what's interesting is that when Anne decided to turn the diary into a publishable work, she created pseudonyms for all of the people that uh, are mentioned in the diary, uh, including her own family. Instead of calling them uh, the Franks, they're called the Robins in her original draft of um, pseudonyms. Well, Otto Frank decided on one hand, he would keep his family's name uh, as the Franks, but he did adopt Anne's use of pseudonyms for the other Jews in hiding and for some of the people who helped hide them. And we see some of those names here. So they're Kugler and Kleiman, two of the people who were hiding them become Kophaus and Kraler. And we also see that um, Fritz Pfeffer becomes Alfred Dussel. And what we learn about him is that his wife was fortunate enough to be out of the country when the war broke out. That's not what Anne wrote. Uh, and he uh, changes um, uh, what Anne actually wrote was accurate, that uh, Pfeffer, Pfeffer, who had been married and divorced uh, in Berlin, had met uh, a woman who was Christian who had also been divorced. Uh, they wanted to get married, but they couldn't because she was Christian, he was a Jew. And the laws forbade marriage you know, uh, 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 of Jews and non-Jews. Uh, and she uh, was in Amsterdam while uh, he was in hiding and was able to stay in touch with him through uh, Mipris, one of the people who was hiding the Jews, although she did not know where he was and was not told uh, uh, this until, until after uh, uh, the war. So um, what this gives you just some sense of the layers of uh, this diary taking shape uh, in the hands of two editors, uh, Anne herself, and then posthumously uh, being edited by her father. Then in the 1990s, yet another edition of the diary appears uh, that integrates um, uh, the um, uh, original diary and the rewritten diary differently than uh, Otto Frank had done. It includes much of the material Otto Frank decided to leave out. It is known as the definitive edition. Uh, this is probably the edition most widely read today, although copies of the uh, original uh, version based on Otto Frank's re redaction um, uh, are still, still circulating. If we look at um, the diaries uh, in published form, we see a number of interesting features 
uh, that are um, significant to its symbolic value. One is that most editions of the diary, and this is the case from the very beginning, include at the start a sample of Anne's handwriting. Uh, this is um, taken from one of uh, many of the English language editions. So you have the handwriting in Dutch and then you have this translation below it uh, in English. And um, including this symbolically links the book to the original diary. Uh, and it, it suggests that you are, even though you're reading something uh, in print form, originally, this is what it looked like. Originally, this was a private document that you're being given access to. Uh, samples of Anne's handwriting figure in a number of memorial works that are related uh, to her life and work. So for example, this is uh, the entry to uh, the school she had attended in Amsterdam. And uh, you can see that it has over the entry, and this actually extends across the facade of the building, um, a, um, a sort of tile work that reproduces in you know, very large size uh, samples of uh, Anne's handwriting from her diary. And so the building is kind of a monument to the diary. Um, also, we see in a number of stage productions that um, the diary as written by Anne becomes uh, a backdrop for uh, the performance of, of the play. Uh, next thing to consider is that many of the covers, and I think actually most covers, certainly of the ones I've seen of the published diary feature uh, one or more photos of Anne. These are just, um, three examples. The one on the left is the uh, what the cover looked like of the first English language uh, edition. And the one on the right is um, a British edition, uh, which is not called Diary of a Young Girl. It's called the Diary of Anne Frank. Um, and uh, as you see, they don't all use the same photos of Anne. Uh, most of these photos are uh, copies of photos that originally appeared in Anne's first diary notebook because she pasted a lot of pictures of herself in the diary. So this is just one example of a strip of photos of her that she not only pasted in the diary, but she made comments on, you know, which ones she, you know, how she looks in these different photos. She, she was, I think, like uh, many adolescents, very, uh, very self-conscious about her appearance. And um, this is the source for most of those photos, not all, but most of the photos that wind up on the cover of the diary. And um, photos also play an important role in imagining Anne. So just to give you one example, this is a picture of uh, Carol Phillips, who's a Caribbean author, who explained in a 1998 essay uh, and I'm, I'm quoting from him, for the past 10 years or so, I have worked with a large poster of Anne Frank above my desk. In some strange way, she was partly responsible for my beginning to write. And as long as I continue to write, her presence is a comforting one. And this is one of a number of examples of um, literary works and other works in which a photograph of Anne plays a symbolic role, an inspirational role um, of some kind. What's important to bear in mind is that all of the photos that we have seen of Anne on the covers of books or in exhibitions or, or elsewhere, they were all taken before she went into hiding. And so we're left to imagine what she looked like in the last two and a half years of her life. Photos have even been used to imagine Anne if she had survived the war and was still alive. So here, this is an image of what Anne might have looked like had she lived to be 80 years old. It was created for the Anne Frank Trust UK in, the, in England using a technique called forensic compositing. And this was done to, to uh, commemorate 
her 80th birthday, and it was part of a campaign to invite young people to write to an 80-year-old Anne Frank, what would you tell her if you could? And uh, so uh, this is a really remarkable uh, phenomenon. Uh, the third thing, in addition to the handwriting and the photographs that are features of most uh, published editions of the diary, is a diagram of the building 263 Prinzentracht. Um, this is from the uh, original Dutch uh, edition. And this was reproduced obviously with English translation in the earliest English uh, language editions of the diary and in many others. Uh, and others have uh, other ways of representing the building, but it's very common to have uh, diagrams or sometimes photographs of the building uh, that was where Anne and the others hid and where the uh, offices of Otto Frank's company were located. And uh, the uses of all these rooms in the building um, are, are indicated uh, so that you uh, understand the layout of this building. And the presence of this diagram, it's actually an unusual, it's unusual to see um, floor plans of buildings in books that aren't, you know, about architecture. Uh, and in fact, um, the, when I read the diary as a young person, it was the first time I'd ever seen a floor plan and I didn't quite understand how you read it. And I remember my mother having to explain to me like what the windows are and the doors and the staircases. Um, and, uh, but it's so an unusual thing to include, but it's there uh, to uh, not only help you understand the configuration of space, but to keep reminding you of the very strong and complex interrelation of the building and the book. The, you know, the book, with exception of the first two weeks of the diary, all take place in this building. And the movement from room to room and who's in what room are, uh, uh, are important in understanding the, the human dynamics that are going on over the two, two plus years of being in hiding. In the 1950s, people started showing up in Amsterdam to visit this building that they had read about in the published diary. And eventually the building was acquired by a foundation uh, in order to create- I'm installing your software, where's your power source? Right here. Uh, can we mute please folks? Thank you. Um, uh, they, uh, this foundation acquired the building uh, to create a museum, which opened in 1960, and it became one of Amsterdam's most visited sites, attracting well over 1 million visitors a year. I'm not sure if it has reopened yet. I know it did shut uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I don't know if it has reopened at all. And there's uh, news reports now that Amsterdam uh, may be uh, in the whole, whole of the Netherlands may have a shutdown again. But uh, in the pre-pandemic era, I think at its height, it had 1.3 million visitors uh, a year. At Otto Frank's insistence, the rooms uh, inside the annex were kept largely empty. So this is uh, the attic, which um, uh, you can't visit, uh, but uh, it is not full of all the things that it would have been full of uh, when they were in hiding. Uh, and this is how the other rooms are presented as well, with very little in them. There are a few relics of the time when he and the others were in hiding, uh, perhaps most famously uh, this wall uh, of photos that Anne had put up in her bedroom. Uh, but even more uh, strategic uh, in the Anne Frank house is this hinged bookcase, which was, uh, was uh, mounted on, uh, on, on hinges so that it could open like a door. And uh, when it was closed, it concealed the hiding place from the rest of the building. The building and the diary have a, uh, a recursive relationship. The book leads readers to visit the Anne Frank house. Visitors to the house are led to read or reread the diary. 
Um, I, when I uh, met with people who work at the museum, I asked them if they had any sense of how many visitors had read the diary before coming there. And they said they think about half. So a lot of people are coming to this museum not having read the diary, but many then are prompted to read the diary uh, afterwards. We certainly hope so. The original first notebook is on display there in a vitrine. Um, and copies of the published diary in multiple languages are for sale in the bookstore. On its website, the Anne Frank House offers a virtual tour of the building. And this is uh, um, one page of, of what, uh, what it looks like, uh, linking each room to passages from the diary. And what happens is you click on a space, in this case, it's lit up for the room, uh, Anne Frank's room, and it will take you to that room. And with it, you will get texts in which what uh, Anne had to say about her room uh, are, are narrated. Um, for the purposes of creating this virtual tour, uh, it was decided, and this was during one of the periods when the building was closed uh, temporarily for renovation, it was decided to dress these empty rooms to show what they might have looked like uh, when uh, people were in hiding in these spaces. So this is not what you see when you visit the museum itself. You see, an, you see empty rooms, but these were uh, furnished with uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, specific kinds of uh, everyday items uh, that uh, they might have had uh, in the spaces for the purposes of this virtual tour. The Anne Frank House itself has inspired works of remembrance of Anne's life and work. It's the subject of works of avant-garde installation art. This is one uh, by Ellen Rothenberg that was created in the 1990s. And uh, it is invoked in um, memorials uh, in, such as this one in Boise, Idaho. Uh, which uh, has this statue of Anne looking out the window of a kind of abstracted hiding space. And the floor plan of the building is actually etched into the ground behind her. You can see it a little bit in this image. Even the chestnut tree that grew behind the building, which Anne mentioned several times in the diary, has become an object of remembrance, especially since the tree fell down in a storm in 2010. Since then, chestnuts harvested from the tree have been sprouted and planted in memorial sites around the world. So uh, to conclude, under the roof of this building at 263 Prinzenracht in Amsterdam, Anne's original diary reposes amid a complex of mediations as visitors tour the building's empty rooms and view its exhibitions, they traverse the layers of Anne's story, written and rewritten, translated and edited, published and materialized, inhabited and imagined. These layers of mediation from diary to book and beyond, even though they're often conflated or elided, inform the millions of readers' encounters with Anne's life and work. Indeed, when readers discover that these layers of composition and rewriting and editing uh, and dramatizing and, 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 and imagining the diary, uh, when they learn about these things, this expands the story of Anne's life beyond her short years into another ongoing narrative about creating, sharing, and engaging with a single life story through this multitude of mediations. And with that, I conclude. And uh, Paul, I, we can turn to questions at this point, if you like. Sure, thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was really a fascinating talk. And, um, you know, in a, in a way, you really brought her to life. 
you know, to tell us a little bit how she lived and the, and the situation she lived, but especially in the way you, you, you talked about the various recensions, the various versions of the diary, you know, that, that this, was, this was really something that was, was worked over and, um, and, and, and was an ongoing process. So thank you so much for bringing us into her life that way. I would also say we, we talked about the photos that she pasted into the diary and her comments on the photos. Just, I think, really fascinating. Thank you so much for really a very intriguing and, and fascinating presentation. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to invite people to submit questions in the chat. Uh, we already have a question already. Um, and um, you may have mentioned this to some extent, but if you don't mind uh, to, to going answering it again. Mm -hmm. So one of the teachers asked, what was the process that Otto Frank used to get the diary published? It's a very good story. Um, he uh, uh, had uh, friends who um, encouraged him to do this. And at first some excerpts were published in uh, a Dutch uh, periodical. And that then became something that attracted some interest and he uh, went to a number of publishers, and it may be surprising to know that, you know, the first person, uh, first publishers that he offered this to uh, didn't express interest in it, but eventually uh, the publisher contact um, uh, issued the book in a small edition. And um, what really transformed it was as it moved into more widely read languages and especially English. Um, and the, one of the things that's interesting is that the English language edition of the diary then prompts the creation of its official stage version and its official film version. And those are actually the only licensed dramatic and cinematic versions of the diary that can cite from the diary. Um, and that, of course, there are many other films, documentary films, dramatic films, uh, Japanese anime, it's quite a variety. They tell Anne Frank's story, but they do not cite from the diary because the diary is um, a very carefully regulated property. Uh, and uh, the, the Keepers of the Diary, which is a separate foundation from the foundation that runs the museum in Amsterdam, the Anne Frank Foundation in Basel, Switzerland, and that's where Otto Frank wound up um, moving to and spending the rest of his life after the war, uh, that, foundation that foundation owns the rights to the diary. And... Um, uh, they oversee who may and may not use the diary, and they're very protective of, of the original text. So uh, they're, uh, it's one of the things that's interesting when you look at various uh, dramatic and cinematic adaptations of the diary is how do they deal with the fact that what we know about Anne largely comes from the diary, but you can't actually use the diary verbatim. And how uh, uh, writers deal with that is, is quite interesting to, um, uh, to see. That, uh, uh, that could be a whole other lecture. Oh, thank you. That's, that's actually fascinating. I was not aware of that. Um, we have some more questions that are coming in. Uh, here's a question. How were the diaries discovered? And could you tell us about what happened to the people who supported them? But I think meaning the, the Franks and the people in hiding. Right, so um, uh, the story is that um, uh, the arrest happens you know, very abruptly, very suddenly. It's still uncertain how um, the, uh, uh, the German forces aided by Dutch police found that there were people there. There are multiple theories of uh, who may have betrayed them. There's no, there's no sure definitive answer. 
Uh, but you know, they uh, sweep in, arrest them, take them out uh, very abruptly, and most of their things are left behind. And once it's and and uh, Mitris was one of the people there at the time, and of course this was a, a, a horrifying, terrifying moment, and heartbreaking. Um, but after she felt it was safe to go into the hiding place, she went in to just see what was there, and she picked up various uh, papers and things that were left behind, uh, and, including Anne's diary. And she says, and people have interviewed her uh, after the war uh, uh, numerous times, she said, I put it in my desk drawer and um, I didn't look at it because first I thought, well, I'll return it to Anne if she survives. And then when it was clear that she hadn't survived and only her father had survived, she gives them to her father. And she said, I never looked at it. And she said, if I had looked at it, I would have had to destroy it because it named actual people who were helping to hide um, the, the Franks and the Van Peltzes and, 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 and Pfeffer, uh, and it could be used as evidence against them. So, uh, which is a remarkable thing to think about. Um, all of the people who helped, uh, and there were, uh, um, there's sort of an inner circle of about four people and then another, uh, other people who were, uh, in on this, uh, you know, very secret project, helping for, to get food, for example, with wet ration coupons and things like that. It was a very difficult uh, task. Um, uh, they all survived the war, although I think uh, uh, a, a couple of the men were sent to concentration camps because they had been hiding Jews, and that was um, that was criminal behavior. Uh, but they survived and come uh, and came back later. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, and the, the and Mitris was the, uh, uh, who was a young woman at the time, she lived until 2010, I think she was, um, you know, close to 100 at the time, um, and became, especially after Otto Frank passed away in 1980, if I remember correctly, she became the sort of living representative of um, uh, if not the, the 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 Franks, but the the operation of protecting uh, these eight Jews in hiding. And thank thank you very much for that uh, and for for exploring. Um, I have a bunch of questions. I'm not sure we're going to get to all of them. So, but let me let's. We still have a few more minutes, so let's see what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in your opinion, why do you think the diary continues to hold a prominent place? in Holocaust studies? Well, you know, I think part of it is, it is an, you know, it's, it is established early on as uh, really the first widely read personal document related to the war. Uh, and the personal documents take you into a historical moment, any historical moment differently than, um, you know, historical books that take a, a wider perspective. Uh, on on events and uh, it's um, it's uh, the fact that it appeared early is a, a, an important factor. The fact that it is uh, in its in the, the form Otto Frank put together uh, 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 from these two pieces, it's an engaging book to read, um, and uh, much of Anne's voice is there, and he actually you know, worked hard to, to uh, uh, preserve that, even putting in things she took out um, uh, that he felt really were, you know, key to understanding her. And she was a gifted writer. And, there, you know, to see uh, such a talented young writer um, at, at this, this early age, that's an important uh, part of it. And once a work like this becomes widely established, it takes on a life of its own. Um, being staged, being filmed, uh, and at, a, at around the same time, being curricularized. So this was one of the first, if not the first book that is, is part of the Holocaust that is assigned to students in uh, public schools. 
And uh, so that made it very widely read uh, as a book. And then it, um, it, it continued to have this following. And then it starts to inspire uh, all kinds of artistic engagements, especially starting in, in the 1970s, you get uh, musical adaptations, you get uh, fictional accounts, uh, perhaps the most famous is um, uh, Philip Roth's Ghostwriter, which is written in 1979, if I remember correctly, in which he imagines, well, what if Anne Frank had survived the war? Um, and one of the things he argues in the book, in this very you know, provocative imaginary thing is that she would have realized she um, could not reveal that she was still alive because she had achieved such renown by not being alive. And um, it was a very provocative idea, um, but it, it, you know, he was one of the first people to uh, imagine his way through fiction or poetry into Anne's life or the lives of other people. There are novels about uh, Peter, the boy, the, the Van Peltz's son, uh, and uh, there are biographies of other characters. Uh, anyone who has any attachment to Anne Frank, Anne and her sister had pen pals before they went into hiding, who lived in the United States. And they published a book about the letters that they had sent back and forth to Anne and Margot. So it, it winds up, um, uh, generating uh, interest upon interest and imagination upon imagination. And uh, following that trajectory, that's, that's another lecture too, but it's quite, it's quite remarkable to see how that unfolds over time in different places and in different forms. Oh, thank you. And it, it, it's, it's interesting and, and, you know, I don't know, inspiring to hear how talented she was. And of course, the flip side is, how, tra how uh, obviously tragic that all of these people were, were, were killed, but also somebody of great talent in the, specifically. Here's another question. Um, in addition to the use of pseudonyms, what, if any other modifications to Anne's diary content did her father Otto make? Uh, or did any other editors make? So there are... Um Apparently, um, other people have studied the early editions, uh, the, the German and the French and the English editions, and noticed that there are, um, each one made their own slight redactions. And um, uh, they all had different ideas about how much to include Anne's uh, discussion about going through puberty. Uh, and some were, you know, shyer about this than others. Um, the thing, the, Otto Frank made uh, a number of changes, one of which I pointed out to you. The one that became uh, most, uh, I guess you could say notorious, is wa that uh, it was discovered and, and after he died, I believe, um, that he had removed uh, a section of the diary in which Anne, uh, who had a very fraught relationship with her mother, uh, wrote something uh, very unkind, uh, not only about her mother, but about her parents' marriage. And Otto Frank uh, took it out. And whether it was out of respect for his wife's memory or uh, his own concerns, whatever it was, he took this out and it was posthumously restored to the text. So, um, you know, par part of what we see is uh, the, the struggles that he was facing uh, as someone who, you know, certainly had never anticipated a project like this, was not a professional writer or editor dealing with deeply heartfelt personal material and what, what, to, what to leave in and what to take out was, I think, largely a personally driven uh, decision. No, oh, thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, and I, I, let me try to see if I get this correct. Um, uh, the, the, the person asking the question uh, would like you to comment on the romanticization in, and infantilization of Anne. And she says, why in the uh, English language title, it's called A Diary of a Young Girl. And the, the person who poses the question, says that Anne was a young woman and not a young girl. 
So it's a very good observation. And uh, one of the things that, that it um, points up is, you know, changing ideas about adolescence generally, changing ideas about adolescent writing. Uh, the English language title, um, uh, part of what's interesting to me, and I believe this was done in cooperation with Otto Frank, the cover photo of that original edition, which I showed you later, shows Anne when she's like about 10 years old, very young, before she had started writing the diary. And apparently Otto Frank picked that picture. It may be a testament to how he thought of his younger daughter as, you know, his little girl, you know. Um, and even though what the diary is all about is, you know, at, 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 a, at a certain level, it's about adolescence. It's about becoming a young woman. And the, the struggles that, that, you know, and discoveries that, that, that come with that. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that starts to happen after the uh, critical edition of the diary is published is the diary becomes a great interest to feminist scholars who are interested in adolescent young women's writing and uh, to see the process, to see how the 15-year-old Anne edits the 13-year-old Anne. And we see how much she was growing as a person and as a writer. This was something that uh, made people, you know, reassess this diary of a young girl uh, to realize that this is, this is a, a, a work of adolescent writing about, you know, being in this transitional period into adulthood. And so it's a, it's a good observation that someone made. It was not an observation that was made when the diary was first published in English. And even though that title endures, um, I would say that uh, there's just a much greater awareness and it's been there uh, really at this point for decades uh, to think of her as a young woman, not as, as a, a young girl. Thank you so much for that answer. It's kind of, it's, it's amazing to see uh, how rich the diary is, how rich her writing was, uh, how rich this whole, whole, you know, the whole process is. And, and again, what a talented writer uh, Anne was. Um, just, I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, uh, I'll give you a choice. There's either a question about the, the, uh, whether the people who hid the Frank family were recognized by Israel as righteous among the nations, or there was also a question about people hiding in Amsterdam and, and how many people were used to hide people in Amsterdam. So whichever ones you would like to answer. Well, I don't know the answer to the first question. Uh, okay. So uh, for the second one, there, there was an, uh, a lot of people being hidden, not just in Amsterdam, but throughout Holland. Uh, a lot of children were hidden uh, in the countryside, uh, people who lived on farms. And um, there, but there, there were a number of people uh, either as individuals, which is actually more common, or as families going into hiding in, in Amsterdam. It was not an uncommon uh, phenomenon at all. Right, thank you, thank you. And I know that there is, I, my understanding is many of those people were found out that, yeah. and, and especially in Amsterdam. Um, but I think in the countryside, people did a little better, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think especially if they were children and could be sort of, you know, integrated into a family as this orphaned cousin, and there weren't so many people who knew about your identity. But in the city, people were, uh, were, were uh, once they knew people were in hiding, they knew they could just, you know, start looking for them and, and root them out. Um, and they did so quite, um, quite viciously. Yeah, yeah. Well, I... Uh um, let me thank you for a, really a wonderful presentation about uh, a really a fascinating person and a fascinating work. Um, I learned a lot today and I hope that the other people here, uh, you know, uh, in, in the lecture learned as well. Um, I just want to take a moment to, um, again, to thank you, uh, Professor Chandler, for, 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 uh, for speaking today. Um, again, um, our next uh, program, which is for teachers in Jewish schools, is on December 26th. 
um, and I could let people know about that if they're interested. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, um, and if uh, Professor Chandler, if you're willing, I could send questions your way. Uh, sure. Okay, if you're willing, so please email me if you didn't get a chance to, to, to have your question answered. And uh, uh, please, uh, I'll just make another uh, appeal. So those of you who are teachers, um, you'll be getting a, um, an email with a link to an evaluation form and a CTLE form. Please fill that out and return it, uh, return it uh, as soon as you can or submit it as soon as you can. And I wanna wish everybody a great afternoon. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.